Hey, welcome back to the channel, everybody. Now, I had planned on doing response videos to Christina's food forest videos um, in the spring, but yesterday she uploaded a video talking about her food forest and her plans. Uh, and I thought, actually, you know what? I'm gonna do a response video on that. We'll just get it started right away. So first, just up front, I wanna be um, cognizant of the fact that creating your own food forest in your backyard is a very personal experience and it creates a lot of inner growth. There's a big difference between gardening and then turning your land into something that sustains your family. There's something spiritual in there and a lot of the growth and excitement that happens when we do this comes from within the individual. So I wanna make sure that when I'm giving any kind of advice, I'm going to keep it fairly high level in general. And I want the advice to apply to as many people at home watching this video as possible. So while I might suggest certain things, I'm going to always try to do it in a way where the user, in this case, Christina, can basically you know, take those suggestions, but then make them her own. It's really important. Um, second thing I want to do is I don't want just her to create a video and then me to bring that video here and have my responses so that you get the complete picture by just watching my stuff. My goal isn't to, you know, leech content and have her create content for me. So what I want to do is take parts of the video, but I want to make sure that there's enough of what she did on her video that it really entices you to go check her video out. So I think the ideal way to digest these videos would actually be to probably watch hers first in completion. Think about how you might answer some of the questions or concerns that she brings up and then come back and see how I did it. And maybe some of your ideas will actually be better than mine. And if you listen to mine first, you might not come to the conclusion of your own ideas and you might have a better idea than I do. Last thing, if you have any great ideas and I don't touch on them and you've done something that really works in your area, you've done something, especially if it's in her zone, like nine, zone nine, and it really worked well, if you have any native plants for Vancouver Island, BC area suggestions for her, you know, that is where the value really comes from. So I really want the comment section in these videos to be explosive and full of ideas. This is gonna be a really fun project and I hope you guys enjoy it as much as I will. So let's get going. Let's start watching her video. Welcome back to my channel. I have kind of an exciting project that I am working on that I've kind of hinted to in some of my videos, but I am gonna be starting a food forest. So this is gonna be an interesting project for me. So if you don't already know, and I'm certainly not the expert, a food forest is basically, it's also called forest gardening, and it's using some of the principles that you might find in ecology and taking them into the realm of gardening. And it definitely falls under the like permaculture umbrella with uh, gardening. There actually can be a huge benefit for um, our food systems from using this kind of gardening or this kind of system to grow our food because it is much more in line with something that wildlife would also inhabit and you can also use native plants and turn it into a bit of a native plant ecosystem as well so it combines a lot of different things and so I'm going about it a little bit of a different way than some people because I do want to try to incorporate as many native plants as I can so I just love this. I think a lot of people typically come to the permaculture side of things because they come from a gardening and food production side of things and they see the unsustainability in the way that we grow our food. So they want to create sustainability and regeneration in there. But the first food forest that a new person coming from that pathway would create is typically going to be very food focused. It's really important that we create a system that is an ecosystem. We don't just create a food production system. That's orcharding, and if you wanna get into orcharding, that's totally fine, it's a way to do it. I don't think it's the right way um, because it leads to a whole bunch of problems when we spray and kill everything because we wanna get rid of our pests uh, using human inputs instead of building an ecosystem where nature will handle that stuff for us. 
So um, Christina coming from this perspective is fantastic because um, it's really jumping into a food forest production with the perfect, correct frame of mind. I'm definitely gonna be experimenting with non-native plants, but I am having a bit of a lens of, you know, attracting wildlife and providing wildlife habitat along with also getting food for myself. So I'm going to be trying to go at it with a bit more of a wildlife native plant and habitat focused lens than some people who might just be purely about the 100% food production. Now, as far as the native versus non-native thing, this is really, really important that we stick with native plants as much as possible. I don't necessarily think you have to go exclusively that way. And I have a really good tip for how you can kind of balance that. The permaculture way of solving pest problems, you know, compared to orcharding and spraying everything is that we want to bring in pest predators because um, insects can be resistant to herbicides, but no insect is resistant to getting its head bitten off by a predator. So we want to bring those predators in and the predator populations and the pollinator populations, they're looking for specific native plants. And if you plant non-natives, they may not want to come into your land. If you plant the native plants that they like, you're going to get more native pollinators and pest predators. It's really important. So in the herbaceous layer specifically, you should go exclusively or almost exclusively. If you have a pet plant that you want to put in, go ahead. That's fine. Make sure it's not invasive and all that, but try to go as exclusive as possible in the herbaceous layer with native plants. If there is a fruit tree that is non-native that you really want to put into your system, I'm not going to fault anybody for planting something that they really truly want to eat because at the end of the day, that is the goal that most of us have. So if you're going to go non-native, go in the tree species with non-native, maybe a bush species that you really, really are excited to try out. Make sure that it's not invasive. Make sure that it's going to play nice and monitor it really really monitor it and see how it's behaving in your property and remove it at any sign of invasiveness but in the herbaceous layer definitely go with the natives the way that i discovered food forests and forest gardening and permaculture was actually through a youtube channel called canadian permaculture legacy and uh, he actually found my channel and uh, he recommended that I check out um, some stuff with permaculture and food forests because he, he thought it would be up my alley and it, it took me a while I had to really wrap my mind around the concept and kind of make sure this wasn't just like fad gardening or like some sort of trend or something that I wasn't interested in but what really got me interested in this was well one was the idea that I could go out to a forest and like almost everything is edible this is really exciting to see someone like this because I remember being in that frame of mind thinking I'm going to go out to my own forest. I'm going to get all the food. It's everything around me is going to be edible. There's going to be animals and everything around me. It was at this time that, you know, I developed the nickname of Disney princess from my wife. Thankfully she hasn't called me that in a while, but um, she used to call me like Disney princess because I'd go out and feed the birds and the rabbits would come right up to my feet and all this kind of stuff. This aspect of transforming your land will change everyone who experiences it. There is just, there's no way you can experience something like that without fundamentally changing everything about yourself. Even if you are already a nature lover, eating with nature and sharing the same food, there is something that completely will transform you. I'm so excited to see um, your level of excitement in this and I promise you this will be the reason why you do this. This will be the best thing that you ever do. I'm very excited to watch specifically that aspect of this because you know I was there and I absolutely that that is why I'm still doing this like five years later that feeling right there. And there's animals within it rather than these kind of monoculture systems that you just assume like all gardening is going to be like this exact way with the raised beds and you have to kind of have your crops like in a line um but instead a forest gardening system is going to attract in beneficial insects it's going to improve the soil it's going to help provide um wildlife habitat for some species and so i was i was sold i forgot to add to uh i as a scientist am increasingly more worried about climate change and the impact that climate change has on food security 
and having a food forest in my own backyard and being able to move towards a self-sufficient landscape and using the land I have to feed myself is a very, very big reason why I got into this. You know, this 100%. This is why uh, my channel started out as like a permaculture gardening channel. But one of my other core loves in life is the prepping side of things. It's self-reliance, self-resiliency. And that's a really fun side thing to get into and try to push it as far as possible. You know, there's a lot of fun things we can do in our spare time, different hobbies. Trying to get as self-sufficient as possible is really enjoyable. I have to say it's one of the most fun things. You know, turning compost is really fun. I don't know why. Um, minimizing how much you buy, um, minimizing the junk that is in your life, simplifying your life, and specifically preparing, canning, storing all your food, knowing that you have food in your backyard so that if the world shuts down, I have a year's worth of Jerusalem artichokes in my backyard. You know, that is very, very satisfying and fun. So, you know, everything that you're saying there about food security, I think is a really good idea. And even just cost of inflation, think about how much food is going to inflate based on, you know, the global economy, 6% inflation. I think uh, we're predicting like 8 to 12% inflation specifically on food this year. You plant a tree in your backyard for $35, $40, $50, $50, and that tree is going to provide X amount of food. That food is independent of inflation. So that val the apples that you grow on your tree, the cherries you grow on your tree, they're only going to get more valuable in time, not only in the amount that they produce, but also the dollar amount that they're worth, the value that they bring into your life, your, your wealth, the wealth that you have. It's not just money. It's all the things that save you money, all the things that give you value. So let's talk about my future food forest. So behind me is going to be the area that I'm going to be transforming into a food forest. And I'm not ruling out my entire yard <laughs> turning into a food forest. I think that's probably what's gonna happen eventually, but um, I need to start with something a little bit more manageable, I think right now. Deciding how big you wanna go with this, make sure that you have buy-in from your family. Um, if it wasn't for my wife, every square inch of my property would probably be planted out with trees. And that is not necessarily healthy for a relationship, you know, to allow my obsession to take over something that is also hers. So make sure that there's, a, you know, an understood compromise between what you want to do and your boiling, bubbling over passion. And I'm not just talking to Christina, I'm talking to everyone watching this. I know you all have that because I had it. Um, you want to just go crazy. And, uh, you know, I certainly did. And uh, my wife kind of reins me in. And um, not in a bad way. It's actually in a very good, healthy, constructive way because it also gets me to slow down and it gets me to improve the stuff that I'm doing in the moment. It makes all the trees that I plant and all the little guilds that I create to be more well thought out and designed because if it was up to me, I would just cover my whole property in wood chips and I would plant every square inch with trees. And it would probably be less functional than if I force myself to slow down. So make sure that you have the buy-in from, you know, your significant other, anyone else that you're impacting, because you're not just impacting yourself. You're not just impacting nature. You're impacting the lives of other people. So make sure that you're cognizant and aware of that. So I am going to be uh, turning a lot of this area into my food forest. So I actually already planted um, an apple tree, which you can see behind me. That is a Gravenstein apple that I just got from the nursery. Uh, I didn't really think that much about it. I just bought it and planted it. So I'm not sure if I plant it in the best spot, but I'm working with what we have. I also planted a fig tree. I think it's Violette de Bordeaux fig. That was the variety. Okay, so in my consultation work, one of the first things that I do when assessing a property is I look at the anchor points. I look at the things that are already there that are likely not changing, the factors of permanence, you might want to say, and I design around those. I start in that area. So this apple tree, for example, is a perfect example of an anchor point. Note that down, put that as something that's not going to change. I mean, you could technically uproot it and move it, but you might kill it and there's really no need to. It's in a fairly good sunspot. So start your design around there. And what I like to do when I'm 
implementing a design and you know if you're working by yourself you're going you're going to create this design and it's going to be you know the whole picture but then you're going to have to go do it so the best thing to do is instead of trying to do everything at once focus on one square foot and get that square foot set the way that you want it and then go to the next square foot and get that set the way you want it whether you start right at your back door and you create an herb garden there for culinary herbs for your kitchen or you start at an anchor point like this apple tree and you design that guild and you have a big picture in mind, you have your big design, but you start at that guild and you get that set up and you get that sorted out. So you put your garlic chives there, your comfrey, any kind of bushes you want, herbaceous flowers for pollinators. You get a deep tap-rooted nutrient accumulator there and you set up your nitrogen fixers. You get that guild solid and then you can move outwards from there and you just take it on like eating an elephant, like one little bite at a time. The fig tree right now is uh, wrapped up in a little bit of uh, kind of winter protection because it got really cold here. It's January, so I'm protecting it a bit from the cold. I've started mulching some of the beds that I want to plant fruit trees in, but I'm just not sure yet about my pathways and about my layout, and I also don't have enough mulch to do the entire thing. Um, so I'm not really sure what to do. Okay, so for someone starting fresh, I always recommend for mulch to get it in place as soon as possible. I mean, ideally, you have an area mulched out a year before a tree goes in there. And what that's going to do is it's going to, first off, it's going to kill the grass, which is going to compete with the tree while the tree's young. Once the tree's older, it can handle grass. It can handle craziness around it. Nature does all the time. When the tree's a little bit younger, it wants the herbaceous layer slightly suppressed so that it's getting full sun. The second thing it's gonna do is it's gonna help to start the soil transition. The soil has to transition from a grassland bacterial dominated microbiology towards a fungal dominated forest soil. And the sheet mulching, the wood chips, that's gonna help facilitate that. And for anyone who wants more info on that, definitely check out my soil microbiology guide. If you haven't watched that one yet, it's probably the single video that you'll benefit the most from because it's got a lot of technical knowledge in there on proper ways to set up a garden and why they work. And it's not the same for every garden. A food forest garden and a lettuce growing um, annual garden require very different soil types. So make sure that you check that out. Like I would love to just mulch the whole area and figure out pathways later, but I'm at a little bit of a lack of mulch or I've tried contacting landscape companies and a lot of them actually give their mulch to people that sell them. So I'm looking at a huge cost for mulch and I'm not sure if I'm ready to commit to that yet. Now a food forest garden shouldn't cost you a ton of money. It should be pretty much the trees. If you really want to, you know, go out and buy mulch and all that kind of stuff and you've got the money to do that, I'm not going to fault anyone for that. Go do it. Um, but if you're in an area that has trees, you know, if you're in an area where it's been deforested, it's, it can be really hard to get mulch. So you might be forced to do that, but you can always find some source of organic matter. It doesn't have to be wood chips. It can be leaves. It can be sawdust. It's ideal if it's maybe wood chips. Um, it can be orange juice peels. You know, it's maybe not the most sightly thing, but there's been food forests that have been grown out of an orange peel dump site. And 10 years later, they have an orange tree orchard food forest growing there. It's crazy. So all that you need for mulch is you, you just need organic matter now. Nature will kind of take care of everything else. Just a little funny story. When I started this, I called anyone that was an arborist and I called the municipalities and I asked for their line clearing um, divisions and I talked to them and I called pretty much anyone that I knew that created wood chips and I just asked them what they do with it and if they'd ever want to drop off a load at my place. And a really funny story, when I first first got into this and I was doing all that, I couldn't find anyone in, at the beginning. And there was an area of my province where they were expanding the highway and to expand the highway, they were cutting trees down and they were chipping the trees and leaving it by the side of the road. So. I actually bought three tarps from Home Depot and I had an old minivan at the time. I took out the middle seats of the minivan when I'd go to work and I'd put the tarps in the van and then I would fill that van floor to ceiling right up to the front seat so I'd have wood chips behind me driving home and I filled that van floor to ceiling with wood chips and my wife, you know, 
was livid with me and I would do it every single day for basically like a month and that's how I got my wood chips and I remember driving home being giddy and we had creepy crawlies in the van um we had we found worms in there there was wood chips in there to the day we sold it we found them under the rugs and right in the seat latches and yeah so my wife hated that but that's where I got my initial wood chips from when there's a will there's a way and go out and find the best way that you can find wood chips. If you have to buy it, that's fine. But if you call around a lot and you work really hard, you can probably find it. Also check Chip Drop. This is a website where you can, um, Arborist can sign up as a donator of wood chips and you can sign up as a receiver of wood chips and they'll try to kind of match you guys up and they'll dump a load. The only thing is they dump big loads of wood chips, but that's good because wood chips, uh, you, you're gonna need a lot of wood chips for a, a smaller area. A pile of wood chips, you'll be surprised how fast you, you run through a pile of wood chips. But uh, definitely think about trying to get, find a free source of wood chips. I really like that idea. But I do have a lot of mulched areas where I can start planting fruit trees and berries. And I actually have ordered a bunch. Um, I'll show you some of the fruit trees and berries that I've ordered that are coming in February. Okay, so now Christina starts going through some of the fruit trees and berries and bushes that she's ordered. I'm not going to talk about this at all because I want you to go check out her video. Um, especially if you live in the BC area, these are fantastic choices. Every single one of them is a fantastic choice specifically the service berries. I have planted probably close to 80 service berries. Um, there's the Saskatoon berries. So there's uh, Amelanchier canadensis and Amelanchier alnifolia. The alnifolia variety is the Saskatoon berry. It'll have a bit of a bigger sweet berry. The canadensis is more of a wildlife bird berry. So if you're really focusing on the wildlife side of things, you can also look to pick up a canadensis service berry. Um, but the alnifolia one is going to be a fantastic berry. They're so tasty. Uh, everything she's suggesting are fantastic choices. If you have other suggestions for her, leave her leave them in the comments below. She's got a lot of things. I'm not going to mention them. I want you to go check out her channel. So go watch her video specifically, especially on this area, if you want to know what stuff she's planting in her backyard. And she also mentions the nursery that she buys from. So if you're in that local area and you want to find a specific nursery that she's getting her trees from, Go check out her video and you'll find the information there. Okay, now the only plant that I'm going to talk about that she did buy is uh, comfrey. And um, in her video, she mentions that she swapped from a wild variety to a named variety, probably a Bocking 4 or a Bocking 14 is probably the one. And that's one that is sterile from seed. When I saw in the video that she was getting wild comfrey, I kind of like, eep. Um, there's nothing wrong with comfrey. Just remember that Comfrey has ridiculous tap roots, really, really deep tap roots. It's why we use it as a nutrient accumulator, a deep tap root and nutrient accumulator. Once comfrey has established in an area, you're going to need an excavator that goes 20 feet down into the ground to get it out. Because if you try to dig this thing out, you will create more of it. You'll fracture roots and each root will become its own plant. So there's only two ways to get rid of the comfrey. One is basically excavating your backyard down to 20 feet and then redoing it. And that probably still won't work. The second is to just constantly chop it, chop it, chop it, chop it, drop it down, chop it and starve it of light or tarp over it. Nothing, nothing can survive that. So if you have comfrey in an area that you don't want it, that's how you get rid of it. However, the comfrey spreading through seed means that it will go kind of wherever and it might end up in your neighbor's backyard. It might end up causing a bit of a problem somewhere. So if you want to be a responsible permaculture, food forest, um, wild gardening uh, gardener, then definitely go with a sterile from seed version of comfrey. This is a fantastic idea. And Christina, I'm glad that you made that swap. So good swap. So with the food forest, I can't just plant fruit trees. So I am also going to be planting support trees and I'm not, I'm like a complete beginner at this. I'm not an expert. So please feel free to correct me about any of this in the comment section. But the idea in permaculture, one of the ideas is of guilds. And so you have a group of plants in each guild working together to provide functions to each other. Planting a fruit tree and that fruit tree is going to make up the tree portion of my guild and this within my fruit tree guild I'm also going to have nitrogen fixing species. I am going to try clover, I'm going to try alfalfa 
and I'm gonna try um, what I already actually have on my property is Ceanothus, which is a native to North America species. Another thing that I want to have in my guilds is pollinator attractors, and though these are going to be easy for me because I have so many native plants that I can plant as pollinator attractors. So I have a lot that I'm doing, but some of the main ones that I'm really working on right now are goldenrod, yarrow, pearly everlasting, I have, I have a number of native pollinator attractors that I'm going to be incorporating in. So this, I'm really going to shine, I think, in, in that area. And I also want to do, um, I think they're called like the aromatic pest confusers. I don't know if that's the right word, but basically it's like a very stinky plant that's going to repel insects from my fruit trees. So man, Christina knocked the guild thing out of the park. She's got it all totally figured out, which is no surprise. She's a wildlife biologist. Um, that is just a fantastic retention and understanding of permaculture guilds. Amazing, very, very, very impressive. Um, the one thing I wanna add into that is don't paralyze yourself when you're designing your own guilds. There's really no right or wrong way to do it. What you're doing is you're creating the functions inside the guild. You're not unlocking some kind of secret combination of plants that you have to get perfect. So don't be sitting there struggling thinking, you know, what pollinator attractor am I gonna put in? What herbaceous layer plants am I gonna put in? What bushes am I gonna put in? The whole synergy doesn't come from this specific plant works with that specific plant. For the for 99% of the cases in gardening, that stuff is hogwash. For the most part, things like planting marigolds next to tomatoes, yeah, that works, but it works because you've got an aromatic confuser next to a vegetable that would bring in pests. It's not the marigold specifically that unlocks that ability, it's the function. So when you're designing your guilds, don't sweat about it. You're not gonna make mistakes. What you're doing is you're trying to put all the Lego pieces together so that they fit. You want a nice tall tree, and then you don't want all this wasted space and then a ground level. You wanna capture as much photosynthesis. So you're gonna put bushes under the tree, and then you're gonna put tall herbaceous plants, and then you're gonna put a ground cover. The reason why we're doing that is anywhere that you've got these plants, it's an area for a pest predator to kind of nest and hide and attack a pest. So having herbaceous layers, bushes all integrated and combined together, those make for the healthiest forest. If you've got um, an apple with a bunch of yarrow kind of growing up inside that apple tree, then now you, you're bringing in those pest predators and they're right next to where the pests are. When they lay their eggs on the underside of the apple leaves, they're just going to gobble them up. So this is how you unlock the power of guilds. It's by taking all the functions. So you've got nitrogen fixers, you've got nitrogen absorbers, uh, eaters, um, you've got uh, pollinator attractors, you've got deep tap rooted nutrient accumulators that you're gonna use to build soil, and you've got um, aromatic confusers for pests. Fantastic. It's the functions that you wanna really maximize. You're not unlocking some secret. So don't be paralyzed when you're making your guilds. Just get going and start building it out. And don't be afraid of just letting it evolve over time. You can put the food forest in and then you can just keep planting. This is something that's gonna evolve over the rest of your life. Don't feel like you gotta get it perfect first. The worst thing you can do is get paralyzed by um, analysis paralysis. What we need and what you are gonna want, what especially seven years from now you is gonna want, is that you started today. You started right away and you got things going and you'll figure it out as you go. So I'm gonna try a few things in here. I have started garlic chives. I also have a lot of herbs. I have dill, um, I have cilantro, and a lot of edible herbs that I wanna to try to fulfill this role. And then, not finally, but another system I wanna kinda of have is a uh, ground cover. Because I have an issue with Bermuda grass, my lawn is seeded with Bermuda grass, so I need a ground cover to kinda of keep that at bay. Uh, so I'm going to be trying wild strawberry, which is native. So wild strawberry will be a big one for my ground cover. I might also try clover, which um, I really like clover. I'm just, just a fan of it. So um, I'm going to try clover. But uh, any other suggestions you have for ground covers? Bonus to ones that are native in BC. Uh, they're all fantastic choices. And just the only thing I would say is that they're probably like a tenth of what you should be cramming in there. So 
don't just stop at these plants. Keep looking for more and more and more and just cram them all in. The more diversity that you get, especially in your herbaceous layer, the more different insects you'll get and the more different insects that you get in a food forest, um, the more balance you'll get naturally. So it's that balance that we're really seeking with this herbaceous layer. So your herbaceous layer should probably be roughly 10 times the size of uh, your tree layer. So if you've got one tree, you should have at least 10 different herbaceous layer plants around it. If you've got 10 trees, you probably want to be looking at somewhere around, you know, 100 different herbaceous layer plants, maybe at least 20 to 30 different plants. So you can't, uh, if you, as long as you're sticking with native plants, you really can't go wrong with overplanting this area. It's more important that you overplant it than you underplant it. That's how you'll get that um, ecosystem balance and you'll start solving all your pest problems before they even happen. One last tip when you're designing out your garden, make sure that all the boundaries of your entire design space have at least some native pollinator attractors in it. And that's because any kind of insects that are floating and fluttering around just outside your boundary, you want to lure them and entice them and bring them into your property. So they fly in and they go, holy smokes, look at this place. And then they start laying eggs and becoming naturalized on your property. So make sure that the edges of your property are just going to funnel in any kind of uh, pest predators, pollinators, that sort of thing. So those are some of the species I'm going to be experimenting with. So I will be planting my fruit and berry trees in February. Planting in February. Oh my God. What I would give to be able to plant trees and break ground in February. I'm so jealous. With my last frost being in March, so I can start planting all those support species as well. Another exciting thing is that Keith with Canadian Permaculture Legacy is going to be working with me on my journey of starting a food forest from nothing. Like, I literally started from lawn. Uh, he has done it before and uh, will be providing some tips. So, so we're going to be doing a little bit of a collaboration in the spring summer once uh, everything starts waking up a bit more and uh, he's going to be giving me some tips on my food forest and hopefully I can show you guys what the fruit trees and the shrubs look like once they're a bit planted out and we can see the landscape a little bit better. Uh, one quick tip regarding fall planting versus spring planting. You want to assess where your death season is. So if you're in Texas, your death season is not December. Um, it's probably in the middle of summer. For us uh, in Ontario, uh, zone four, zone five, our death season is like February. So what you wanna do in your planting strategy is wherever plants are gonna be most likely to die, you wanna plant as far away from that as possible. So if you're in Texas, you wanna go with a fall planting. So you get your death season, everything dies in the summer, and you plant like right after that when temps start cooling down and you get those plants in the ground as soon as possible. That way the plant can grow the roots underground and give it its best chance to survive until the next death season comes. In cold climates, if you're in a really cold climate, the ideal time to plant is not in fall. It's probably going to be in spring as soon as you can break the ground. So uh, for Canadian gardeners, um, you really want to be planting as soon as you can break ground with the shovel and, you know, break it up in a good way so it's not ice blocks because you want to have the soil around the roots, right? So as, as soon as you can crumble the soil part and get the soil around the roots while you plant the trees, that's when you want to do it as soon as possible in the season so that by the time the winter comes, that tree has been in the ground for as long as possible. Um, for zone nine, it's kind of a nice mix. Uh, you don't really have a death season, so you can kind of do whatever you want and you might want to match when plants go on sale. So maybe you do a fall planting. If you really want to get started for the season, um, then maybe you do a spring planting and you get going right away because that'll buy you an extra, you know, half year of growth until, uh, you know, you'll be a, a half, six months ahead on when you get your first set of fruit. Okay, so I think that is pretty much it for the first video. This one's actually gonna be quite long. I hope, you know, I think there's a lot of great tips in this video and I hope that um, you feel the way that I did, that this probably went better than I even expected. There's so much content that you can unlock when you watch someone doing something for the first time. And for me, it's really enjoyable to see that in other people uh, because, you know, I had that burning fire of passion when I first started and it's still there, it's just, 
you know, it's weathered with experience and time and, uh, of doing this and living in the system. It just transitions. Uh, but the, man, the fire and the passion when I first started filling my van with those wood chips and the tarp, I was, I was certifiable insane in those, in those first couple of years. So it's fun to see that in other people. I just love it. Uh, so if you like this video, if, uh, let me know in the comments below what you thought of this. Um, for any uh, viewers coming from Christina's channel, welcome aboard. I hope you join us here and I hope you enjoy permaculture. Hope you um, continue to, you know, your amazing work that you're probably doing in wild gardening and maybe uh, throw some fruit trees and food bushes and do it in a sustainable permaculture way. The stuff that Christina does on her channel and the stuff that I do on this channel, they are a perfect alignment of ethics core values in terms of you know respect for nature and growing and living sustainably on this planet so i hope that you guys uh, enjoy that uh, collaboration that we're going to do and we'll do a lot more of these uh, christine if you have any other videos uh, like um, questions feel free to make a video and we'll do another one of these i think it's fantastic comment content and i hope that uh, everyone watching this has taken something out of this that they can then apply into their own life. So thanks for watching everybody. And I'll see you on the next one.